The milk shop was a quaint little shop. Some might even say cute. The shopkeeper, disappointingly, was not a wizened old mysterious man. Just a nervous-looking young woman wearing fading yellow robes. Harry had insisted on coming here straight away, first thing. Harry had something he needed to put into the pouch as soon as possible. It wasn't the bag of galleons that McGonagall had allowed him to withdraw from Gringotts. It was all the other galleons that Harry had surreptitiously shoved into his pocket after accidentally falling into a heap of gold coins. That had been a real accident, but Harry was never one to discard an opportunity. One Moke Super Pouch QX31 heavier, Harry and McGonagall pushed their way out of the door. Are you really Harry Potter? I only know what other people have told me. I've been told my name was Harry Potter as long as I remember. But... There's no reason why they wouldn't just find another wizarding orphan and raise him to believe that he was Harry Potter. No, you have your mother's eyes. I suppose you could be in on it too. I'm just glad that you're alive. Thank you, Harry Potter. Thank you for what you did. I'll leave you alone now. That was not well done. I know you're not used to this, Mr. Potter, but people do care about you. I suppose there's no chance that if I said fundamental attribution error, you'd have any idea what that meant. No, but please explain. Well, when we look at others, we see personality traits that explain their behavior. But when we look at ourselves, we see circumstances that explain our behavior. So the fundamental attribution error is that we explain by permanent, enduring traits what would be better explained by circumstance and context. I think I understand. But what does that have to do with you? People think that I saved them from you-know-who because I'm some kind of great warrior of the light because I have some kind of permanent, enduring, destroy-the-dark-lord trait. I was 15 months old at the time. I don't know what happened, but I would guess it had something to do with, as the saying goes, contingent environmental circumstances. And certainly nothing to do with my personality. People don't care about me. They aren't even paying attention to me. They want to shake hands with a bad explanation. Do you know what really happened? I have formed a conjecture. After meeting you, that is. You triumphed over the Dark Lord by being more awful than he was, and survived the killing curse by being more terrible than death. Ha ha ha. Let's get you to Madame Malkin's next. I'm going to go off for a few minutes while you get fitted for your robes. Where are you going? I'm buying a drink, which I desperately need. You are to get fitted for your robes, nothing else. I will come back to check up on you shortly, and I expect to find Madame Malkin's shop still standing and not in any way on fire. Madame Malkin got out a set of animated writhing bits of cloth that seemed to serve as tape measures and set to work examining the medium of her art. Next to Harry, a pale young boy with a pointed face and awesome cool blonde white hair seemed to be going through the final stages of a similar process. One of Malkin's two assistants was carefully examining the white-haired boy. Hello! Hogwarts, too. Harry could predict where this conversation was about to go, and he decided in a split second of frustration that enough was enough. Good heavens! It couldn't be! Your name, sir? Draco Malfoy. It is you! Draco Malfoy! I, I never thought I'd be so honored, sir! It's good to meet someone who knows his place. Eh, damn, Harry was having trouble thinking up of his next line. Well, everyone did want to shake the hand of Harry Potter, so... When my clothes are fitted, sir, might you deign to shake my hand? I should wish nothing more to put the capper upon this day, nay, this month, indeed, my whole lifetime. I think you ask an unwarranted familiarity with my person. What have you ever done for the Malfoy family that entitles you to such a request? No, no, sir, I understand. I'm sorry for asking. I should be honored to clean your boots, rather. Indeed. Though your wish is understandable enough. Tell me, what house do you think you might be sorted into? I'm bound for Slytherin House, of course, like my father Lucius before me. And for you, I should guess House Hufflepuff, or perhaps House Elf. Professor McGonagall says that, I'm the most Ravenclaw person she's ever seen or heard tell of in legend, so much so that Rowena herself would tell me to get out more, whatever that means, you'd do well in Slytherin House too. Usually, it's only my father who gets that sort of groveling. I'm hoping the other Slytherin will suck up to me now I'm at Hogwarts. I guess this is a good sign, then. Actually, sorry. I've got no idea who you are, really. Oh, come on! Why'd you go and do that, then? And how do you not know about the Malfoys? Who are you? 
Harry Potter, pleased to meet you. Harry Potter? The Harry? And the boy cut off abruptly. There was a brief silence. Harry Potter? The Harry Potter? Gosh, I've always wanted to meet you. Can I have your autograph? No, wait. I want a picture with you first. Burst into flames and die. But you're Harry Potter, the glorious savior of the wizarding world, defeater of the Dark Lord, everyone's hero, Harry Potter. I've always wanted to be just like you when I grow up, so I can defeat Dark Lords too. Draco cut off the words in mid-sentence. His face froze in absolute horror. Tall, white-haired, coldly elegant in black robes of the finest quality. His eyes regarded the room with the dispassionate quality of an executioner, a man to whom killing was not painful, nor even deliciously forbidden, but just a routine activity like breathing. That was the man who had, just that moment, strolled in through the open door. Draco, what are you saying? In one split second of sympathetic panic, Harry formulated a rescue plan. Lucius Malfoy! THE Lucius Malfoy? I am so, so honored to meet you. Your son has been telling me all about you. But of course, I knew about you all before then. Everybody knows about you, the great Lucius Malfoy. I've been thinking about trying to get into Slytherin House myself, just because I heard you were in it as a child. What are you saying, Mr. Potter? Professor McGonagall burst in a second later. <coughs> Professor McGonagall, is it really you? I've heard so much about you from my father. I've been thinking of trying to get sorted into Gryffindor so I can... What? I leave you alone for five minutes. Five minutes, Mr. Potter, by the very clock. I was only joking around. Draco Malfoy said in front of his father that he wanted to be sorted into Gryffindor. Joking around isn't enough to do that. What part of Get Fitted for Robes sounded to you like please cast a confundus charm on the entire universe? He was in a situational context where those actions made internal sense. No, don't explain. I don't want to know what happened in here. Ever. Whatever demonic force of chaos inhabits you, it is contagious, and I don't want to end up like poor Draco Malfoy. I'm not quite done being fitted for clothes. Why don't you go back and have another drink?